Well, thank you for leading us so well as you always do. I want to make mention that Herman and Judith have uh, had the safe arrival of their first grandchild, a girl, second, second grandchild. Is that right? Yeah. I'm doing my best up here. <laughs> Alia, Le- yeah, Rebecca and Eli, so congratulations to you guys. Well, it's basically half ten, and so send a peace offering to the Sunday school teachers. I tell you, because we're just getting underway now, and it is a joy to be here and in the Word of God with you. And we have a couple of Sundays, both today and then uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and obviously Good Friday. And so I wanted to take some time over these couple of Sundays, including the Friday, to consider something that's very uh, dear to my heart, and uh, it is uh, the doctrine of the active obedience and the doctrine of the particular redemption of Christ. The Puritan Thomas Watson said this, what a miracle of love is it that God should love us when there was nothing lovely in us? End quote. We were each born into this world to live one very fast and fleeting life. Our time on earth is very brief, very brief. It's but a vapor. We're like grass that withers. We're like the flowers that fade. And in a brief moment, in God's economy of time, Jesus Christ will return. And at that time, lasting, final judgment will commence. Those who are Christian shall enter into heaven's eternal glory, and those who are not Christian shall enter into hell's eternal agony. Heaven only has one entrance, hell has no exits. And there's a question that I'm often asking people, whether it's in evangelism or for things like baptism here at church, and it's this, this is the question, if you were to pass away today and God was to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say? The answer is always quite revealing. A person who understands the gospel of the Lord Jesus and a person who does not understand the gospel of the Lord Jesus obviously give two very different answers. Only one reflects the reality of the gospel However, one answer is to the effect of this, well, God should let me in because I've done so on and so forth, and so I hope that means that I can enter in. After all, God is love. Another answer is to the effect of, in and of myself, is no good thing. As Thomas Watson said, there's nothing lovely in us. And it's not what I've done at all but because of what Christ has done for me. That's my hope and my only hope of entering into your heaven. I have no other plea. It's because of Christ. And so as we come into this Easter season, really, I want us both this morning and next Lord's Day and Good Friday to consider our salvation, to turn our hearts and minds to our salvation. To consider it, the salvation that we've received as a gift and the salvation that is freely offered and available to the world. There are two doctrinal truths that I mentioned that have a very sweet spot in my heart and I hope to encourage your heart with them this morning. They're found very simply in the title of the message this morning, which I've entitled very simply, The Active Obedience and Particular Redemption of Jesus Christ. Now, don't switch off on me when you hear those terms. I realize for some, they may be altogether foreign. Perhaps you've heard them before, but don't quite have a deep working definition for them. Or perhaps you're here and you do understand what is meant. Regardless of where you fit, my intention, my hope, and my prayer is that these two truths will become very, very dear to us in new ways. For behind the words, active obedience, and particular 
redemption is after all the person and work of Jesus. The love of Jesus, the work of Jesus, the glory and grace of Jesus for us to behold and to draw us into deeper communion with Him. And so over the next two Sundays, concluding on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, I want to look at these Christ-filled truths in the hope, really, that Christ is further formed in us. When we're born again, Christ is in us. We have Christ in us. He's for us. And then the longing of God by His Spirit is that Christ would be further and further formed in us. And each of us here this morning is on, is on either further a journey in that formation of Christ in us. And so our hope would be that each of us lays hold of more of Jesus. And today I have a very simple outline. It's an outline that seeks to achieve the goal that I just explained, that Christ would have a larger and fuller place in our hearts and also that people within earshot of my voice would come to know Christ and experience the blessing of being a Christ follower. And so, a simple outline, just to break it down, to break down these treasures, if you will, of our salvation. If you're taking notes, here it is. We'll see this morning two atoms. Two atoms. And second, we'll see two aspects, two aspects, and then we'll round it out with two applications, two atoms, two aspects, and two applications. And before we get underway through all three of those headings, I wanted to set the scene a little. The Bible makes it clear, and we know this, that humanity, outside of a saving relationship with the only Savior the world has is under the wrath and judgment of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, the unrighteous will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We're told in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so it's clear that we need to be righteous in order to be in God's presence, acceptable in His sight, both in this life on earth and in the life to come in heaven. Very simply put, only righteousness is acceptable to God. Revelation chapter 21 verse 27 says, when speaking of heaven, that nothing unclean, that is unrighteous, will ever enter it, is what it says. Nothing unrighteous will ever enter into heaven. God as we've just sung, is a thrice holy God. He is holy, holy, holy. And nothing but holy righteousness will stand before Him acceptable. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, speaking of our God, it says, the rock. The rock. He is perfect for all His ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is He. And so our righteous God only allows righteous people to enter into His presence and without righteousness, you will not enter into fellowship with God. J.C. Ryle rightly addresses where most all people think righteousness comes from for right standing with God. He said this, quote, Some tell us that repentance and the amending of your life will enable us to stand in God's presence presence as righteous, end quote. Now, for sure, without having turned away from a lifestyle of habitual, ongoing, life-dominated sin, a person will never enter in. But repentance and an amendment of your lifestyle will never atone for sin, ever. 
J.C. Ryle also said this, quote, Some tell us that their trust is in a well-spent life not doing people any harm, end quote. That really illustrates a low view of sin, because when you and I stop to think about it, not even a day or an hour can go by without there being some kind of failure in our life to glorify God as He ought to be glorified, or some kind of idolatry or coveting in our heart. Ryle also added this, quote, Some tell us that their sincerity will carry them through. They say, listen to this, Has God not commanded us to honor His Word? Has not God commanded us to honor His church? Has God not commanded us to honor His ministers and His ordinances? All this we do, and then surely He will accept us. And so this is all sounding quite impossible, you say. This seems an impossible task. How can I be righteous? How can I be with God? What am I to do? Well, it's to the two Adams that we must now turn under this first heading, number one, two Adams. Why two Adams? Well, you see, our existence, our salvation, our story hangs upon two Adams. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and while you're turning there, let me say this, and you're good Bible people, you can turn to a passage while listening to something else and absorb it and take it in. In Genesis chapter 1, we read, don't we, that God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, we read that God placed the man, Adam, whom He had created in the garden, in the garden. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8 says, Yahweh, God, planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there He placed the man, Adam, whom He had formed. And so God gave Adam a realm to rule over. In many ways, Adam was a king of sorts over that realm. God also appointed Adam as what is called the federal head over all his offspring. There's only one race, the Adamic race. There's many ethnicities, but we all come from Adam. Adam is the federal head over all humanity, the entirety of humanity. Since we all come from Adam and his fall became our fall, his fallen nature becomes ours and his guilty standing also becomes ours. I want you to Trust you've turned to 1 Corinthians 15, but I want you to listen to the first half of Romans chapter 5, verse 19, as I read it for you, just to set the scene here. It says, through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. We understand this. As a result of Adam's disobedience to God, the world was plunged into sin. Adam disobeyed and we were made sinners by nature. Now, if you look at verse 22 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where you are now, we read as clear as day the words, look there with me, the beginning of verse 22, for as in Adam, all die. If you're in Adam, you're dead. So, that's Adam. Adam was a real man. He sinned. He plunged us all into sin and the condemnation of sin. Why don't you look at the first part of verse 47 in 1 Corinthians 15. Look what it says. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The first man is from the earth, earthy. Adam is our earthly man. He's our federal man. Head. Federal means covenant. He's our covenant head when we're without Christ. Now look at the second half of verse 47. It says, the second man is from heaven. Two men, one earthly, one heavenly. Now glance up at verse 45 in that same chapter. Verse 45 says, 
It's written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. That is, God breathed the breath of life into him. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam was created, placed in the garden, given a realm to rule over, appointed as our federal representative head. But then get this, Adam, the first Adam, was obligated by a law of commandments. He was given a set of law of commandments by God. Genesis chapter 2, 15 15 says this, God took the man, put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. To cultivate it and to keep it. There's also another dynamic about the commands that were given to Adam, which Adam received from God in the garden. And that is that if Adam kept the law of God, then he would have eternal life. He would have eternal life. Now, if you haven't heard of this before, I want you to stick with me. God promised eternal life to Adam if he obeyed. You see, sometimes we forget that there's two trees in the garden. You ever forget there's two trees in the garden? Sometimes we just think of one tree. There's two. Not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but also what? The tree of life. That's right tree of life. Both of those trees are important. You see, as has been well said, Adam's obedience was not just for the sake of obedience. Sometimes that's what we think. We don't understand the depths of what's going on in the garden. We don't rightly understand the garden and we just think that Adam's obedience was simply just for the sake of obedience, but it was not simply for the sake of obedience. There were promises made to Adam promises that if he obeyed, then that life represented by the tree of life would be his. We know this because in heaven we read in places like Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 and in Revelation chapter 22 that there's a tree of life for those who were saved. And then if you take that and then add to that, when Adam fell into sin... What did God do? Kicked him out of the garden. And we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, this. Yahweh God sent Adam out of the garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man, Adam, out. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword. Listen to this. Which turned every direction to what? Guard the way to the tree of life. If Adam had kept the law perfectly, then his reward would have been the gaining of eternal life. That was the arrangement between God and Adam in the garden. It's a very similar arrangement God made with Israel. When he said to them in Leviticus chapter 18 verse 5, which says, So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments, that is my law, By which, listen to this, a man may live if he does them. I am Yahweh. Now, of course, humanity cannot keep the law perfectly so as to attain eternal life. Fallen humanity. But this is the arrangement here with Adam and Israel. Keep the law and get eternal life. Adam, unlike Israel who were fallen like us, he was able to obey unto life. And that was the promise made to Adam, life eternal as a reward for obedience. Adam was certainly under what we could call a works principle, very akin to a covenant. Why? God not only promised reward to Adam, but he also threatened Adam. Adam with penalties if he disobeyed. He promised reward for obedience and he threatened penalties for disobedience. You know this verse, I'm sure, Genesis chapter 2 verse 17, which says this, to Adam, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you 
will surely die. And so the first Adam had two trees, one for life and one for the knowledge of good and evil. Threats to not eat one, and in fulfilling obedience, the genuine arrangement of eternal life from the tree of life. But we know what happened, right? Adam failed. Adam sinned. And because he is the representative head of all of humanity, we all fell into sin and condemnation too. Why? Because as theologians like to say, Adam was not a private person, he was a public person. He was a public person. He, in that regard, he represented humanity. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this, Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. That's the first Adam. The one we read is earthly. The second Adam, that one we read is heavenly. That's the Lord Jesus. I want you to look at the remainder of verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 15. I'll read it all again. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Alive. We do strange things as Christians. We get up early and we come to this building and we sing songs and we pray and we give of our, give of our finances and we give of ourselves, and we, we sit under sermons and we devote ourselves to worship because we've been made alive. We are unlike those around us who are in Adam and dead. We have been made alive. The second Adam, the Lord Jesus, is the one suitable to stand and conquer where the first Adam failed. The first Adam failed. You think of things like God in the garden with Adam, he failed. God takes his son, his beloved son, the son whom he loves, out into the wilderness. And Jesus is tempted for 40 days. And in his humanity, he did not fail, but he stood. You see, our final destination is determined by the works of these two Adams. Both Adams worked. You see, the first Adam was in a contractual arrangement with God the Father. Obey the law and get life. Disobey and get death. Well, so too was the second Adam under contractual, even covenantal arrangement. What do I mean? All three persons of the Trinity... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, planned, accomplished, and applied salvation in the Lord Jesus. Did God just leave fallen humanity in a hopeless state forever? Well, the answer surely is a resounding no, because from out of God's love, He sent His only begotten Son, the Son whom He loves, to come and redeem a people so undeserving, so full of sin... And so unworthy. And this plan of redemption was made before time began. The second Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says this, that God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace, listen to this, which He gave us our salvation, gave us our salvation in Christ Jesus before time began began. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 says this, in the hope of eternal life, salvation, which God, who cannot lie, listen to this, promised long ages ago. Same Greek structure, before time began. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah 42. We're talking about the second Adam, the precious Lord Jesus and Isaiah 42, look at verse 1. This is God's promise concerning the Lord Jesus, 
Yahweh God says, Behold my servant, that's Jesus, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or raise his voice, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice justice. He will not be disheartened or crushed until he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands will wait expectantly for his law. Verse 5, thus says God Yahweh, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. Look at verse 6, I am Yahweh. I have called you. He's talking to his son. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you, my son, by the hand and watch over you, my son. And I will appoint you, my son, as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations. Verse 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Spiritual prison, spiritual darkness. Salvation comes by the son whom the father sins and loves. You see, what we just read there, I trust you see Yahweh, God the Father, I trust you see the servant of Yahweh, the Lord Jesus, and also the spirit of Yahweh, all three persons of the Trinity working. And the Lord Jesus assigned a task and given a mission. I want you to flick ahead with me to Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50 for a moment. And what we're about to read are, Jesus, are words of Jesus indicating very clearly his willingness to obey and to fulfill this contractual arrangement made to him by his father. Look at verse 50, beginning in chapter 50, rather, beginning in verse 4. Yahweh God, or the Lord Yahweh, has given me, that's Jesus, the tongue of disciples, that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. The Lord Yahweh has opened my ear, look at this, and I was not disobedient. Nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation And spitting, look at verse 7, for the Lord Yahweh helps me. Therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. We could read, we could keep reading. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together with each other. Who has a case against me? Let him draw near to me. Behold, the Lord God, he helps me. That's remarkable. God the Father gave the Son commands to obey. He called the Son to take on a human nature and dwell on earth. He called the Son to obey all the laws while He was here on earth. And He called the Son to suffer death. And here's something to note. Just like the first Adam was the federal representative head for all those that are in Him, so too... Is Jesus the federal head of all those that are in him? For it is for those people the Father gave to him who the Son would live for and die for, and it's those people alone. On Good Friday, I want us to consider particular redemption. Today is the active obedience of Christ. In John chapter 10, it was read earlier, John chapter 10, verse 27 to 29, Jesus himself said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now listen to this. My Father who has given them to me. When were they given? Before time began. Given before time began. The Son came to give life. He came to restore the ruin of the first Adam. He came as the second Adam, not an earthly man, but a heavenly man who came to earth, 
that those he saves would get to heaven. That's the two Adams. Both under arrangements to obey, one failed and the other did not fail but was victorious. And now, under the second point of our outline, we'll see just how Jesus, the second Adam, accomplished this salvation for us. Heading number two, we've seen two Adams and now we see two aspects, really two aspects of our salvation. It was in the late 1800s and into the 1930s, a man by the name of J. Gresham Machen, he lived and served as a professor of Princeton. He was also the founder and president of Westminster Theological Seminary. And on New Year's Eve, 1936, he was laying sick in bed, about to die. He was at the end of his life and ministry, he was about to die. And he wrote one last telegram, they had telegrams back then, and he wrote a telegram to his friend, and they are the last words ever recorded from him, because he would die just a few hours later. And the telegram said this, and he wrote this with his own hand. He said, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. No hope without it. And so we have to ask ourselves, what was it that captured that man's heart? That after all his lectures, all his books, all his sermons, that he would take this one thing called the active obedience of Christ as such a pillar of hope and joy for himself. What was it? I'll tell you what it was. It was the understanding that Jesus certainly did die a death on a cross for our sins. That's for sure. And that's a very important aspect of our salvation. But the other very important aspect of our salvation is that Jesus Christ lived a perfect obedience to the law of God that you and I cannot live. Both aspects, his death upon a cross and his life lived keeping the law perfectly are the required aspects of our salvation. If you only have one, you don't have the fullness of salvation. It's not either or, it's both aspects. Now listen to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5, which says, When the fullness of time came, God, the Father, sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Born under the law, so that He might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and children. Jesus Christ lived under the demands of the law. Unlike Adam, who was also under the demands of and commands of the law, Jesus, and only Jesus, lived a life perfectly and perpetually, which means ongoing, keeping the law. And why is that important and why does it even matter? Well, if you ask most all Christians where their hope for eternal life lay, they would say, in the work of Christ on the cross for them. And that's true. Christ on the cross for me and His resurrection, I don't need anything else. But that's only half true. That's not what the Protestant reformers recovered and discovered. The Protestant reformers, they would begin to look at two Adams and say Christ had an active obedience to the law of God, which is essential for salvation. I just want to tell you something, and it's already 11, but I'll make you extra hungry for lunch. <laughs> My theology professor at seminary was fired for denying this. It took a long time to fire him because there's other guys that agreed with him. Some people deny this doctrine of the active obedience of Christ, thinking that you're going to embrace certain theologies that will do away with, say, for example, some of your eschatology. No. If you do not have an active obedience of Christ understanding, then you have half a gospel. Now, just a little pastoral word here. You may have been a Christian a very long time, 
and you're only now learning about the active obedience of Christ, you're not unsaved. (laughs) We believe in Jesus by faith and faith alone and this is just some more glory to behold, to warm your heart. Why is this all essential? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the forgiveness of sins is not enough. It's not enough. Being washed clean of sin is not enough. To stand in God's presence, simply washed clean, is not enough to enter into heaven. The removal of sin's guilt is one thing. The necessary righteousness to stand in God's presence is another. You see, the law of God had what is called both positive demands, love God, love your neighbor, but the law also had penalties. They're called penal sanctions. If you murder, you die. If you steal, there's a consequence, a price must be paid. And it's only Jesus who did both perfectly for us. Adam failed to keep the law, Israel failed to keep the law, you and I failed to keep the law, for outside of being in Christ, we are in Adam. Amazingly enough, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 7, we read God establishing two main offerings that Israel was to observe, thanksgiving offerings and sacrificial offerings. It's past 11, you need to take the peace offering to the Sunday school teachers. One had an atoning sacrificial component. The other had a positive praise component. Christ, by His life and His death, is the greatest fulfillment of that old Levitical offering. The two of them. Because His life was an offering of positive law-keeping and His death was an atoning sacrifice. You see, Jesus' ministry of salvation did not begin on the cross at Calvary. It began before time when the plan was made by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then from the moment He was born into the world, He began to live a life of praise and thanksgiving by perfectly keeping the law for us. I want you to think about what it looked like, what it meant for Jesus to obey in his life. An article that I read this week was really helpful on this point. You see, Jesus never once did a single thing wrong. None of his outward actions were ever wrong. But also, none of his motivations and thoughts and intentions of his heart was ever wrong. So unlike us. Another thing, having taken on a human nature, he got tired He got hungry, he got incredibly thirsty, and never once being tired, hungry, and thirsty did his guard drop and he said something or did something utterly stupid, so unlike us. Do you know Jesus also knew exactly what it was like to be without much money and all the pressures that not having a lot of money brings? You say, well, how do you know that? Well, you remember Mary and Joseph, his mum and dad, they made an offering of turtle doves. Luke chapter 2, verse 24. Turtle doves. That kind of offering was reserved strictly for the poorest of the poor. He grew up without money. And so under financial pressure, Jesus never once complained or fretted or even worried. So unlike us. As Jesus grew and left home, he would make this most remarkable statement in Matthew chapter 8, verse 20. He said, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. Do you know that not once did Jesus become envious or jealous of what others had as they went back to their home and laid their head down on their pillow and their bed? but he had nowhere to lay his head. As a baby, get this, Jesus never once cried a fit of anger. As a young boy, he never once squabbled with his siblings. As a teen, 
as all the hormones that flood our bodies at that time flooded his, he never once disrespected his mom or his dad. But instead, he perfectly honored the law of God by perfectly honoring his mom and dad. So unlike us. When he grew up and he went inside the temple, and we read that he grew in knowledge and wisdom. You say, well, how does God grow in knowledge of wisdom? Well, we worship the God-man, truly God and truly man. In his humanity, he grew in wisdom and knowledge. And you know, as he grew in wisdom and knowledge in his humanity, and he was with the leaders of Israel, and he was teaching them as a young boy, he never once became prideful in his theological knowledge. He attended every feast and every festival that the law required. He did so even later on in his life when the nation of Israel was trying to kill him. And he still went to every feast to fulfill the law. He kept the law. He never sinned. And then he fulfilled the penalty side of the law by actively obeying God the Father, bowing his will, as we've sung this morning, to his Father's will. The divine essence has one will. Jesus had two wills. He bowed his human will to the will of his Father. And he took up the cross and he walked up that hill. He ascended the holy hill. He had clean hands and a pure heart because he kept the law. And he walked up that hill and he laid down his own life. He kept the law of God. And he fulfilled the contractual arrangement made by his father. And he did so by living and dying for us. It means that we are both forgiven of our sin. That's what his death accomplishes. But get this. It means we are also granted the title to eternal life as a result of his obedient law keeping on our behalf. Eternal life doesn't come in a vacuum. You see, Jesus lived life in obedience to the law. And that doesn't provide the forgiveness of sin. Jesus' death on the cross doesn't satisfy the demands of the law. Jesus' life of obedience grants us eternal life. And His death on the cross grants us the forgiveness of sin. As has been well said, quote, The perfect obedience of Christ is as necessary to entitle believers to eternal life as his suffering of death is to secure them from eternal death, end quote. Simply put, Jesus' law-keeping is merited, earned righteousness to us. You know, it was R.C. Sproul who famously said, we are saved by works, Jesus' works. And so when we stand before God, we don't simply stand as those who have sins forgiven. We stand as those who are righteous in God's sight, in possession of the title of eternal life. Because when we put our trust in Jesus, we are credited with, that is imputed with, that is clothed with the perfect life of law keeping that Jesus lived. That's why justification, to say that justification simply means just as if I never sinned, is so deficient. Justification means God looks at you as though you have only ever perfectly and perpetually obeyed the law. You've only ever been a law keeper. And you weren't. But Jesus was. And that's grace. Here's a thought to ponder on. Long ponder on. Over lunch, making you extra hungry. I just have to get this out. If we only had our sins forgiven and we didn't have the active obedience of Christ to the law perfectly, do you know that we would be just like Adam in the garden before the fall? He was sinless, but he was in need of eternal life. His eternal life was by keeping the law under a works principle But the active obedience of Christ solves the problem because eternal life could only come to Adam through 
perfectly and ongoingly keeping the law. But praise be to God that while we could not keep the law at all, we have been furnished, clothed with a righteousness of perfect law keeping by grace and grace alone. We are no longer in the first Adam. That Adam is of earth and of dust, but we've been united to the second Adam who is perfect and of heaven. And think about this. We are now in such a far more blessed state than Adam was in the garden. Because in the garden before the fall, while Adam was under that works principle to obey for eternal life, Adam had the very real possibility of becoming unrighteous. (laughs) Whereas you and I in Christ, we never have that possibility. Never. We're clothed forever in a righteousness, not our own but one we so desperately needed and one that's been graciously given, merited for us. What a salvation. Jesus truly loves us and he is truly for us and for our salvation. Romans chapter 5 verse 19 says, For as through the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, listen to this, even so through the obedience of the one, Jesus, many will be made sinners. Righteous. Two atoms, two aspects, very quickly, two applications. Number one, just find comfort and consolation for your own soul in the righteous robes that you have received. You have the highest reason to rejoice amidst the trials of life. That you have been granted eternal life, merited by Christ for you, and you will always be accepted. This is a cause for deep lasting joy amidst the pains of life. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in Yahweh. My soul will exult in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. Listen to this. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. You couldn't do anything to earn it. You don't deserve it. You and I, and he clothed us with that. The righteousness of Christ is the grounds for our justification. Thomas Brooks, a Puritan, said this, quote, The saints of old have always placed their happiness, peace, and comfort in their perfect and complete justification rather than the imperfect and incomplete sanctification, end quote. We've been given the perfect holiness and perfect obedience of our Savior, and it's been made ours. That's the first application. Second one, understand That it is the righteousness of God the Father's Son that you have received. And God the Father loves His Son. He loves Him. He loves His Son. And so that love between the Father and the Son, which is immense, flows down to us. We'll never be forsaken. We'll never be left destitute. We will be and we are greatly loved. That's two applications, but there's one implication. And the implication is major. We've been clothed as righteous. Therefore, let us never seek to abuse the grace of righteousness we have received. Let us, by grace, to press into more and more practical righteousness in our own life. Let us forsake more and more of the sin in our life and live out our new life, a life that has come to us by the life of Jesus. There is no hope without it. Jeremiah would prophesy of the coming Messiah in Jeremiah 23, 6, which says his name, Jesus' name, by which he will be called shall be Yahweh, our righteousness. That's his name. That's who we worship. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege it is to be in your word again. Thank you for the joy that is found in these truths. Thank you that you didn't leave us hopeless and without hope in this world, but you sent your beloved son. He lived. He lived. Oh yeah, he he really lived. Thank you for him. Thank you for sending your spirit to enable him to live, to endure in his humanity. 
that he might be a suitable mediator and substitute for us. Lord, let there be no one foolish enough to hear this and reject your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. Allow us to have our hearts warmed by these truths and to rise up now and enjoy fellowship with warm hearts of affection for your Son. Forgive us for when those affections have cooled, when the world has come in, worldly ways of thinking, and forgive us our sin. We come before you and rejoice in these great truths, the treasures of our salvation and the hope that we possess. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen.